okay so what are we going to do today so in the last lecture we discussed the four subspaces and the let me just remind you what they were we were talking about we were having this discussion about this image that i had drawn which was about the row space being in rn and the null space of a both of these spaces are subspaces of the n dimensional space assuming that you are working with an m by n matrix right so the row space is in rn the null space is in rn and the column space on the other hand is in rm because each vector has m entries m rows so this is the column space right and over here what we have another subspace which is the null space null space of a transpose right so you can even think about the row space uh, as the column space of a transpose so this is basically about a transpose a transpose the row space of a transpose null space row space of a but the column space of a transpose right here we're concerned with the null space of a here is the column space of a and here is the null space of a transpose and we were talking that these are um subspaces of these two different spaces right rn and rm okay um we're going to come back to this picture and talk about how these spaces there was one thing that we figured out that the dimension so the dimension of this space r and this space r is going to be equal to the rank right so both of these spaces will have the same dimension and the dimensions of the other two spaces is basically then the this space is m minus r that's the dimension and the dimension of the null space is n minus r so that's the dimensions of these four subspaces of r m and r n right and there's one thing that we need to discuss which is that these subspaces are orthogonal to each other and that's really a term that we need to define first and have a feel for until we can talk about orthogonal subspaces right so the goal is to talk about at the end of the lecture to talk about orthogonal subspaces but we can't really do that until we've figured out this notion of orthogonality and how does that come um from vectors and how then how does it then translate to entire spaces <clears throat> so now before we <clears throat> get to orthogonality of subspaces and before even we get to orthogonality of vectors we need to go back to exercise 1.2 and that's an exercise that i said that we're not going to look at yet because the notions aren't really um apparent and aren't really used much up until this point so i said let's just ignore that for now and just we know we know what a dot product is hopefully by now so let's consider two vectors so let's say i have two vectors x x1 x2 x3 and y y1 y2 y3 so right now i'm dealing with two vectors in three dimensional space right they don't need to be in three dimensional but just to illustrate the idea i'm going to restrict myself to three dimensions so the dot product which we define as the following so the dot product x dot y is basically equals to x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x3 y3 and that's the definition of the dot product that you take these individual components and you multiply them and you add them and another way of writing this dot product was to say x transpose y right so now we've defined it as a matrix operation or rather a vector operation so that we can this is in the language of matrices right so if you think about these as matrices this is a 3 by 1 matrix this is a 3 by 1 matrix and now if this is the product that i want i can just transpose x so x transpose y is going to look like x becomes a row vector x1 x2 x3 and y stays a column vector y1 y2 y3 
and now we can see that this is a natural dot product definition that is a row times a column so we how do we do this multiplication we can see that this is just one row being multiplied with one column so you have x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus x3 times y3 now i can choose to write this in matrix form as well because at the end of the day what you're doing is you're multiplying a 1 by 3 matrix with 3 by 1 uh, matrix and so the result is going to be a 1 by 1 matrix and the reason we don't write it is because a 1 by 1 matrix is just one number right so this is going to be some number in R1 so this is just a scalar sort of it we call it a scalar because it actually belongs to R1 the one dimensional space that it's just one number okay so that's the dot product that's not the only way, by the way, you can take a product of two vectors. There's also something called the outer product, right? This is the dot product is also called the inner product. And the outer product can be taken as X, Y transpose. So now X stays as a column vector, X1, X2, X3, and y stays as a and y turns into a row vector so y1 y2 y3 and so now let's figure out what the dimension of the result is going to be so we're multiplying a 3 by 1 vector with a 1 by 3 vector which means of course they're compatible but the result is going to be a 3 by 3 matrix so the result is going to turn out to be a 3 by 3 matrix and what is that result going to be remember how do we take a how do we do a matrix vector multiplication or how do we do a matrix matrix multiplication we can view it as a linear combination of the columns of the first matrix or the linear combinations of the rows of the second matrix if i view this as a linear combination of the columns of the first matrix now this is just one column right and we only have at this point just one entry so how does that happen which means the linear combination is just being taken by y1 so y1 times the first column right so y1 times the first column which is x1 x2 and x3 which means the first three entries are going to be just y1 x1 y1 x2 and y3 x y1 x3 right or in other words you can just think of it there's lots of ways to think about matrix matrix multiplication right and you can choose any way to think about it um, a simple way is just to look at row times column so this is one row times the first column so x1 y1 then first row times second column x1 y2 then x1 y3 and you can fill out all the rest of the entries so this is x2 y1 x3 y1 x2 y2 x3 y2 and x2 y3 and x3 y3 right so you can view this as a linear combination of the columns so this is a column right so it's just the first column times y1 then it's the first column times y2 and it's the first column times y3 or you can see it as a row right first row times the first entry so y1 y2 y3 times the first entry and that same row times another entry and that same row is right and this outer product is always going to be a rank one matrix what's the rank one matrix it's defined by its name that the rank of this matrix is going to be exactly equals to one that is if you try to do row operations on it Gaussian elimination on it you're only going to get only one pivot right the number of pivots that you're going to get is equals to one and you can immediately see why that might be true because the rows are multiples of each other and the columns are multiples of each other which means as soon as you start doing row operations if you do row 2 times minus um, perhaps x2 upon x1 y1 then you immediately so you can check that row 2 minus x2 upon x1 y1 will immediately give you uh, let's just make it r1 will immediately give you the uh, zeros and then it will give you all zeros here and all zeros here 
but that's um, going off into a tangent. We don't really need the outer product right now, but I thought this was a good place to define it because you may encounter it at some point. So let's focus, uh, take our focus back onto dot products. And now let's talk about orthogonality, orthogonal vectors, right? And orthogonal vectors, so let's define that notion. Orthogonality comes from, is another word for perpendicular, right? So we're talking about orthogonal vectors which is basically just another word for saying these vectors are perpendicular to each other, right? That is, this vector is perpendicular to this vector if there's a 90 degree angle at their point of intersection, right? So that's what it means. And of course, we start vectors from the origin, which means this is the angle that you're looking for, right? So these two vectors are orthogonal. These two vectors, not orthogonal. This vector, this vector, of course, not orthogonal. And these vectors, right? So the first thing that we need is to find a nice little test for orthogonality. And so test for orthogonality. And the test is extremely simple and you've already probably used it as well. Um, it was part of one of the exercise problems where you had to tell why are some vectors or why is a plane perpendicular to a particular vector. And the thing to check is the first, the easiest thing to check uh, what do you want me to repeat for you? Let me know in the comments. Okay. So I was talking about, I don't know what you uh, at what point you sent that message, so let me know. Um, orthogonal, I was talking about orthogonal vectors, and so the test for orthogonality is as follows. You just check X transpose Y, and you check whether it's zero. If X transpose Y is equal to zero, then vectors are orthogonal, right? They're perpendicular to each other. They're intersecting at a 90 degree angle, right? So that's the simplest it's a rather simple test for orthogonality. And it's extremely easy to check, right? So take two vectors, if there's the dot product is zero, you have orthogonal, orthogonal vectors. And this works for any dimension, not just for Rn, we're talking about R3, but for any Rn, right? So R2, same thing, R3, same thing, so on and so forth, right? The question though is why does this test work? So now let's just give a little justification and we're going to give a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional justification and we're going to um, take that as the general rule for all n-dimensional spaces. So here's the idea. Let's say two vectors are orthogonal to each other, then we can add them up. Right? So let's say this was vector x and this was vector y. And if they're 90 degrees with each other, I can just take one vector and put it on the head of the other. And we know what we get when we do such a thing. We get the, we get their sum. When you start from the tail of the first and end at the head of the second one, this vector is x plus y, right? And so on 90 degree, you can see that they form a triangle. And this 90 degree triangle follows, of course, in two dimensions and in three dimensions, we know that the Pythagorean law holds. And what's the Pythagorean, Pythagorean law? It says that the length of this vector and the plus the length squared of this and the length squared of this side equals, equals the length squared of this side, right? So the adjacent squared plus the hypotenuse plus the opposite squared equals to the hypotenuse, right? So in other words, if this is A, B, C, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared, right? So we have X squared. Now this X represents the vector. I want to talk about its length, right? And we can't talk about its length without giving a particular notation. I can't, I can't say X squared because that's something different. That's multiplying a vector by a vector 
Um, and that's not even possible. I can't multiply a three by one vector with a three by one vector. That's not possible. So I'm talking about its length. I'm going to put some symbols here. And what I mean by these simple symbols is the length of x squared plus the length of y squared is going to be equal to the length of x plus y squared. Okay. So let's talk about the length of a vector first. I need that notion. And so from Cal2, you must have seen the length, the notion of the length of a vector, and we define the length of a vector as follows. So if the vector is x1, x2, x3, then we know in Euclidean space at least, you know how do you take the length of a vector? You take its horizontal component and its vertical component, square them and add them, right? So it's something like this, x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, okay? All right, and I want the length squared. So let's just square this. If I square this, I get rid of the um, square root sign, which is nice, x1 squared, x2 squared, plus x3 squared. And I'm going to write it again in matrix notation because <clears throat> that's something that um, we were already dealing with. So it's nice to have everything in matrix notation. So this is just x1, x1 plus x2, um, x2 plus y2, sorry, keep going to x3, x3. And the reason I chose to write x1 squared, x2 squared, x3 squared as this is for you to see that I'm going in the same direction as I went with vectors, right? So a dot product is x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, which means this is just this x1, x1, x2, x2, and x3, x3. The sum is just equals to x transpose x, right? And you can see this easily. If I write x1, x2, x3, and if I write the same vector but now in the column form and take the dot product, it's just x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, right? So the length of a vector is just x transpose x. Okay. So we're going to take this, now that we have this uh, no, um, notion of the length of a vector, we can take this discussion and we can so now this is just x transpose x plus y transpose y is equals to, and I can write this as just x, so just write x plus y transpose x plus y. And that's the idea that we're going to talk about. Let's see, we're talking about the some vectors that are orthogonal. And let's just keep that picture here for reference. This is x plus y, and that's the x plus y vector, okay? So we've brought it down to this equation, and this equation, of course, is only true when you have uh, perpendicular vectors. It's not true in general. In general, you have an inequality in this equation. But let's just um, write this as it is, x dx plus y dy. And if you, know, if you recall the rules about transposes, you might remember that a matrix plus a matrix transpose is just A transpose plus B transpose. So the transpose um, addition and transpose are commutative. You can do transpose first and then do addition or do addition first and then do transpose, doesn't matter. So I can write this as X transpose plus Y transpose and then X plus Y, right? And so now I can do this multiplication. So let's just write out all the terms, X dx plus X t y plus y t x plus y t y. And so you have on both sides x t x and y t y, so those terms drop out, and then you get a nice little um, term on the right-hand side. So y t x and y, sorry, wait, did I cancel? Sorry, plus this is going to be canceled. Okay, so x t y and y t x, it's easy to see that both of these are the same thing. x t y is x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus x3 y3 and y t x is y1 x1, but that's really the same thing, y2 x2 plus y3 x3. Multiplication for numbers is commutative, so this is just the same thing, right? So I can write this as 2 x transpose y, which just tells me that x transpose y is 0, right? So from the Pythagorean law, sort of, I've assumed the Pythagorean law, and then 
given a definition of the then given a justification of why the transpose the dot product is equals to zero although mathematically you view it in the other way so i'm going i'm i'm going from intuition to the mathematical definition but usually what happens is you define the notion of orthogonality as this and then um, go on to say, okay, now that you have this definition for the Pythagorean law, must follow. So you can take it in either direction. If you're, if you're doing a proof, if you're doing rigorous mathematics, you start from the definition and you prove the Pythagorean law. If you're trying to build up your intuition, I think it's a nice way to just look at the law first, look at the look at what you, what property you're looking for, and then derive that um, definition from it. Okay. So now we are defining it for all vectors. So this is the definition of orthogonality that we're going to follow. So this tells us that the vectors are orthogonal. Okay. And of course this law only holds in terms of orthogonal vectors. Otherwise it doesn't hold. Pythagorean law only works for right angle triangles, not anything else. Okay. So we have a notion of orthogonal vectors. Now let's extend that notion not to vectors but to orthogonal spaces, right? So orthogonal subspace. And how do we do that? Subspaces, remember, let's take a few examples of the subspaces that we've seen frequently. The subspace can be just the zero vector, just a point, right? or it can be a vector, a one-dimensional, so dimension zero subspace, a one-dimensional subspace, which comes from a vector. Um, it could be a plane, or it could be, you know, a three-dimensional space. So it could be a line, it could be a plane. So these are the kind of subspaces we know. And now what, what do we mean when I say one subspace is orthogonal to another subspace? Um, let's build that intuition first by looking at two lines, okay? So two lines. When I talk about two lines, it's easy to see because for lines, we already have a notion of what it means for lines to be perpendicular, right? If two lines are perpendicular, we say that they intersect at 90 degrees, right? But now, if I'm thinking about these lines that are being spanned by vectors, right, our elements that we care about are vectors. So on this line, you have vectors like this, of such a sort, and of this sort, and of this sort, and of this sort, okay? And on the other line, you have vectors as well. I seem to have written rid of my line. Here we go. Okay, so these are my vectors. And so what do I mean when I say that these two subspaces are orthogonal? I mean that all vectors, so all, um, all blue vectors are perpendicular, are orthogonal to all orange vectors. For example, if you take any vector x on this line and you take any vector y on this line, then you get that x transpose y is going to be zero for all x and for all y. So we get a nice little notion. So let's say we have a subspace the notion that we're going to have for orthogonality that orthogonal subspaces are orthogonal subspaces. Um, all vectors in, so let's say um, S1 and S2 are orthogonal subspaces, subspaces if all vectors in S1 are orthogonal, are orthogonal to all vectors in S2, right? Mathematically, I can write it like this. 
x transpose y is equal to 0 for all x, so this is the symbol for all, for all x in S1, for all x, for all y in S2. So that's my definition of an orthogonal subspace. Okay? Right. And let's see how that definition holds up in terms of an example for a line and a plane, right? So let's take another example. This example is about a line and a plane. So when is a line perpendicular or orthogonal to a plane, right? Um, and I mean in terms of a subspace. So let's say we have a nice little subspace over here that is two-dimensional. So a plane passing through the origin is my first subspace. And I want now, let's make it slightly flatter so that I can easily make the... Okay, so this is my subspace, right? The first space, subspace. If it's a subspace, um, we know that it's going to pass through the origin, okay? It has to pass through the origin. And now I'm looking for a line such that every vector on that line has to be perpendicular to this plane, which means I need to make that line sort of like this. It needs to extend outwards such that at this point of intersection, if I consider any vector, any vector like this, and if I consider any blue vector on the line, then let's, let's zoom in maybe. Let's see if it's, yeah. So what I mean is that any vector that I draw here, try to make this nice. Okay, any vector that I draw here needs to be perpendicular to any vector on this plane, right? So maybe this plane, maybe this vector and this vector. You can see all of these vectors are orthogonal to this orange vector, right? So over here and over here. There's a 90 degree angle between any such vector and you can take the orange vector in the other direction as well, right? So maybe that vector is going in the other direction. And that's even then at this point of intersection, all vectors will be perpendicular. <coughs> Sorry. So this is sort of a geometric description when a one-dimensional space is perpendicular to a two-dimensional space. Let's see if we can perhaps have an example for two planes. Can two planes, can two two-dimensional planes be orthogonal in at least visually the same way? So if I draw a two-dimensional space like this. And if I then draw, uh, let's make it nicer. So let's say this is my two-dimensional space. And now if I try to make another plane and try to make it stand up like this, right? So that's my original notion of say, let's try to extend it a little bit more. Okay, and so that's my notion of perpendicularity, right? In, at least in geometric terms. And now ask the question, does, does this example also fit the definition that I've set so far, right? So the question is we really need to check that does it satisfy the definition that we've come up with for orthogonality, which means we need to check if all vectors on this two-dimensional space are perpendicular to all vectors in this two-dimensional space, okay? So let's do that. Let's try it out. Okay, so let's consider in this space, this orange, this um, plane that is standing up, let's draw this vector along this line. So these two planes are intersecting along this line. If I draw a vector that is exactly on this line, right? So if I zoom in over here, and if I draw this vector that is on this line of intersection of these two planes, then this orange vector, if I call this plane one, and if I call this plane two, then this orange vector is on both of these planes, right? This orange vector, if I call this, if I call this V, then V is in plane one, 
and V is in plane two. And of course, if V is not orthogonal to itself. If you take a vector, if you take a vector and you take its dot product with itself, as long as it's not the zero vector, you're going to get V1, V1 plus V2, V2 plus V3, V3. All of these terms are squares and positive, of course. This is only going to be zero. So V transpose V is only going to be zero if and only if V itself is zero. But we can see that this vector is not a zero vector. If it was a zero vector, it will just be a point, right? So, and you can maybe take another example, right? So maybe I can take this vector here and this vector here. Even these are not perpendicular, but the nice little way of seeing this is to say if two planes, if two spaces, if two spaces share a non-zero vector, then they are not orthogonal. Because you immediately get this problem of that vector, this vector is not perpendicular to itself. For them to be orthogonal, every vector in this space should be perpendicular to every vector in this space. This common vector will create a problem, right? Okay, so what can I do? I can say that if maybe I can write this more mathematically, and a mathematical way of saying this is that if V, if V intersection W, if V is a subspace, W is a subspace, if their intersection is not the null space, or rather not the sorry about the null space, I mean it's not the zero vector, that is they have something in common, then V is not orthogonal to W. Okay. This this is just a mathematical way of writing that they share some non-zero vector, right? That there's in this case, for example, if we take this line and this plane, so if I call this L1 and if I call this C1, right? In this case, what I had P1 P1 intersection L1 was just the zero vector, right? They had only the zero vector in common notice over here. They have just this point in common. So if they have this, then at least I have some hope of getting perpendicular vectors, right? So, but even this does not directly um, guarantee that I will have a orthogonal subspace. For example, let's think about this um, plane and then a line that is going off at an angle that is not 90 degree now, which means that this at least doesn't guarantee me. So if this is P2, L2. So L2 intersection P2 is still zero, but it doesn't guarantee me, right? So it means that I can say that V intersection W not being equal to zero guarantees that this is not orthogonal subspaces But I cannot say the other way around. I cannot say that if they have just a zero vector in common, then they are orthogonal. That's, this is not true, right? You can't make that connection. This is, let me just put a red line here. This is wrong. You can't say that this implies orthogonality, okay? So this is, Absolutely wrong. Because even if you just have the zero vector in common, it's possible that the vector over here may not be perpendicular to the vector over here. You have hope, you can hope that that might be the case, but you need to check specifically for each vector. Okay. All right. Not true. Okay. So we have at least two examples of orthogonal subspaces, right? So this is not orthogonal. In this case, you do have orthogonal subspaces. This is orthogonal. This is not orthogonal. And over here, these two lines were orthogonal. Okay, so let's just... Uh, 
zoom out. So we have these notions now. What do, what can we do about this now? So let's go to now the important thing is that let's go back to the subspaces that we were talking about in the last lecture, which were the row space, the null space, and the column space. So let's restrict ourselves to this uh, left side, which was Rn. And we have the null space. Row space, no. And here's an important fact about these spaces: that the row space is orthogonal to the null space. Okay, and how do we know this? Of course, this is not an actual image of the row space and the null space; it's just a rough sketch. But it's drawn this way. Dr. Gilbert Stein, Professor Gilbert Stein chose to draw this way because it illustrates the point that they're uh, intersecting at a 90 degree angle, right? So how do we know this? How can we verify this? One way to do this is, of course, to think about what the null space is and the row space is. So what's the row space? Let's go back to the definition. The row space is just all linear combinations, all linear combinations of the rows. So if a matrix A has a few rows, R1, R2, R3, right? These are the rows. Then the row space is basically saying, row space is some vector R1. So vectors in, vectors in row space are essentially linear combinations of the rows, right? So I can say A times R1, plus B times row two, plus C times row three. This is just writing that statement. These are the vectors in my row space. Let's call it V. Okay, what about the null space? The null space has vectors, solutions to AX equals to zero. Okay. All right, so Let's expand this a bit. So if AX equals to zero, then this is the, then X is in the null space of it. So let's expand this and let's view the left-hand side, R1, R2, and R3. Excuse me for a bit. Okay, so if a vector is in the null space, so let's say x is in the null space of A, then if I write the vector x here, then what do I know? On the right-hand side, I have the zero vector, which tells me that when I take this dot product of, if you think about the matrix vector product as row times a column, so what's happening really is that this entry at this entry, this is equals to zero, zero, zero. But I can view this matrix vector product as dot products, right? So the first one is R1 dot X. Second one is R2 dot X. I think this was problem number two or maybe three in the assignment. So R3 dot X. And you can see now that this equation is immediately telling you that at least the rows are perpendicular. So R1 dot product with x is zero, R2 dot product with x is zero, and R3 dot product with x is zero. So immediately you have the fact that the rows are orthogonal to vectors in null space of A. Okay, but that's not enough, right? It's not enough because we want every vector in the row space to be orthogonal to x. 
so far we only got the rows. But we want all vectors. The vectors on the row space are linear combinations of the rows. So I want if V is in the row space, if V is in the row space, and X is in the null space, then V dot X should be equal to zero. This is what we want really. But we have this because now let's write what V dot X is. So consider V dot X. V vector is just a linear combination of the rows. So C1, so A times R1 plus P times row two plus C times row three dot X, right? So I've taken a vector and an arbitrary vector from the row space by taking just the linear combination of the rows. I don't know what combination this is, but every combination can be written in this way. So what do I know? This is simply a matrix multiplication, which is dot product is distributive over addition. So I can just write this as AR1 dot X plus PR2 dot X plus PR3 dot X. And we know that these individual dot products are going to be zero because I have this property. This, these rows are individually orthogonal to the X's because we have this from AX equals to zero. So immediately we get zero, okay? So this establishes at least that the row space is going to be orthogonal to the null space. So Rn, we have the left side of the image where we've not only established that there, this is the row space and this is the null space. Remember the row space is just simply the column space of A transpose and the null space is just null of A. Let's do the same for the right hand side of the picture. And we don't really need to go through any calculation because if you think about this, this is the column space of A, that's just simply CA. And over here you have the null space of A transpose, null of A transpose. The relationship between these two is because of a, this is the null space of A, then this is the column space of A transpose. If this is the null space of A transpose, then this is the column space of A. So notice that A transpose, whole transpose is just A, right? So it's the same kind of relationship between these two matrices or these two spaces as compared to these two spaces. So you have the second fact as well, which is that the column space, the column space is orthogonal to orthogonal to the null space of A transpose, or what we also call the left null space, right? So we call it the left null space because ATX equals to zero is just the same as XT A equals to zero. Okay. So here's the, so here's what we know about the row, so the relationship between row space, which is C of A transpose and null space N of A. The relationship over here is, the first relationship is that the dimension of row space um, is equals to R and the dimension of null space is equals to N minus R. And so, and the relationship that we just discovered is that both spaces are orthogonal to each other. The null space, the null space is orthogonal to the row space. Okay, and this is really nice because think about this. 
when I was talking about orthogonality of subspaces, we discussed an important idea that came up when we were discussing the case of two planes. The idea was that they can't share a vector, which means if the row space and the null space are really orthogonal to each other, then they don't really share any vector, which means if the intersection, the null space, intersection with the column space of a transpose, or in other words, the row space, is always going to be zero. Which means if the null space contains a few vectors, the column space can't contain any of the same vectors. That's the first thing. The other thing is both of them combine together. So their dimensions. So if I call the dimension of the row space, and I add them to the dimension of the null space, then that gives me n. And we were talking about Rn, right? So it gives me the entire dimension of the whole space, which means if there's some vectors here, the rest of the vectors in Rn are going to be here. So when you have these two properties together, that the dimensions add up to the dimensions of the whole space, and the spaces are orthogonal to each other, then you have a special name for this, which is called orthogonal complement, right? So here's a definition for orthogonal complement. That is, if V and W are subspaces of an n-dimensional an n-dimensional space and first thing that the dimension of V plus the dimension of W gives me the dimensions of the whole space which is n and V orthogonal to W then we say that V and W are orthogonal complement of each other, okay? All right, so this is, so the row space is an orthogonal complement. So now we say the row space. So I'm saying both of these facts together, that their dimensions are going to add up to n and their and they are orthogonal to each other. So when I combine these two facts together, I say the row space is the orthogonal complement of the null space. And similarly, carry out the same arguments and you have that the column space C A is the orthogonal complement of the null space A transpose, so null space and A transpose. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? This right here, by the way, this fact, important fact over here, that the dimension of the row space is plus the dimension of the null space is called, is also called the rank nullity, rank nullity theorem. Right, and why is it called the rank nullity theorem? It's called the rank nullity theorem because we know that the dimension of the row space is the same as the rank of the matrix, right? And nullity is basically another word that we're giving to the dimension of the null space. So that's nullity. So it's saying that for an M by M, for an M by N matrix, rank plus nullity is equal to N, right? Is equal to the number of columns that you have in your matrix. Okay. Right. 
you can prove this rank nullity theorem perhaps from the book in Stephen Leon's book. That book is more theoretical. It goes through all the proofs, goes through all the theorem. Um, the Gilbert Frank book is much more intuitive and it sort of goes through the intuitive notions and discusses it. Doesn't really dwell on proof. Okay. So what's next? Let's do an example. Okay, consider the following matrix. Two, one, three, and four, two, six. Okay, I want to de um, determine the nullity and the row space, right? So let's determine that. Okay. So if I want to find the null space, I know that I need to solve Ax equal to zero. So I put a vector here. I know I have to put three components because this is two by three. So I need to multiply it by x1, x2, x3. And the equation becomes Ax equals to how many numbers would I have? Probably just two. So the two by three times three by one is going to give me two by one, right? Okay, and the way we can do this is of course just to do Gaussian elimination and let's just try to do that. And if you've gotten a knack for the way I make matrices, you should immediately see that the second row is a multiple of the first row. So when I attempt to do row two minus two times row one, I get four minus two times two, which is zero, two minus two times two, which is zero, and six minus three times two, which is zero. So how many pivots did I get? I got one, and that means the rank is equals to one. If the rank is equal to one, then I know that the dimension of the row space is also equal to one. And why do I know this? Well, think about the row space. I told you in the last lecture how to find a basis for the row space. And here's the basis. The basis, if you recall, that the basis for row space is basically the non-zero rows in my in R in the reduced in the reduced matrix reduced matrix R. So what's the reduced matrix R? This is R. This is A. Okay. So two one three. So the basis for row space is given by the row two one three, which I'm now going to change into a column vector because I'm I am looking for the column space of a transpose. Same thing, just putting it in the transposed form. Okay. All right, so that's the basis for the row space. And the dimension for the row space is basically, if you think about, if you recall the dimension, the definition of the dimension. The definition of the dimension is the number of vectors in the basis, right? And so the number of vectors in the basis is just one. So the dimension is equal to one. Now at this point, I don't need to do much because if I want to find the dimensions of the null space, I can go about it in two ways. What's the, I can answer the question, what is the dimension of the null space? Well, I can solve Ax equals to zero. That's something that I will attempt. The second thing I can do, and we know that Ax equals to zero when we try to solve it, um, it depends on the number of free variables, right? So how many free variables do I have? One and two. So this is free. Both of these um, columns correspond to free variables. So x2 and x3 are free. So x2, x3 are free which means the dimensions of the null space is going to be equal to two. And I should not have needed to check that even because notice that this matrix is two by three. That means N is equal to three. So if N is equal to three and the rank of the matrix is one, then I know that the dimension of the null space of A 
is going to be n minus r, which is just 3 minus 1, which is again 2. So the dimension is easy to find once you know the rank of the matrix. So the dimension of the null space follows from the rank. Okay. And what is this null space? Let's just find it. Let's just find a basis for the null space. Okay. So here's my matrix again. This is my two, one, three, easy little matrix. Two, one, three, augmented with the zero vector, zero, zero, zero. I know that X2 and X3 are free. So the second equation doesn't really tell me anything. First equation tells me 2X1 plus X2 plus 3X3 is equal to zero, which means X1 is equals to minus x2 minus 3x3 and I divide it by 2 so it's minus half and minus 3 by 2x3. Okay, so let's just make a basis for the null space and recall that we know how to do this because we can write x1, x2, x3. We know what these three variables are going to be now. This is something that we've been doing for a long time. So the first x2 is free and x3 is free. So we just write it like that. And x1 is minus half of x2 and minus 3 by 2 of x3. So I can write this down as a vector minus half x2, x2, 0, plus minus 3 by 2 x3, 0, x3. So here's now finally the basis x2, take it common. I have minus half, I have one, I have zero, plus I have x3 and I have minus three by two, zero, one. And I don't really like fractions, so it's just messy to compute with. You can stay, scale this, right? We can just take the half common, this is just a number, right? So if I want to absorb this, half over here, just multiply the whole thing by two and we get some a times minus one, two, zero, plus x three times, this is minus three, zero, two. So I've done nothing but what this was telling me that this is some vector and this is some vector in some other direction. And all I did was to scale them. I just multiplied this vector. So the same vector, but now multiplied by two. So just took larger vectors instead of the same vectors, but that doesn't really change anything because this vector and this vector are on the same line, okay? So you can, of course, do that. You can get rid of fractions if you want. So, and let's just change this to P. So I have now a basis for the null space of A. And what's that basis? That basis is minus one, two, zero, and minus three, zero, two, and I have two bases now, one for the null space and one for the row space. Let me just bring this down. And we're going to check if we're going to verify an important statement that we've, that we've made, that these two are orthogonal complements. So both, both of these spaces, so the null space and the column space A transpose, both of these were subspaces of R3, right? Okay, the dimension over here is two, the dimension over here is three, so um, it's easy to see that rank plus nullity, or rather, let's just not look about that, let's just think about dimensions of the null space and plus the dimension of the different transpose here, and column space of A transpose is equal to three. So the first property of being orthogonal complements is being satisfied, and we knew this was going to happen because we've talked about a general case. And now let's talk about orthogonality. Let's do first a rough check. Let's see, is this vector perpendicular to this vector? So let's say minus one, two. So let's talk about this is, um, let's call this V1, V2, and call this R1. Okay, so V1 transpose R1. That's going to be minus 1, 2, 0, and then 
two, one, three. And that's just minus two, plus two, zero, zero. Okay, nice, that worked out. V2 transpose R1 gives me what? Second matrix is minus three, zero, two. And over here we have two, one, three. Okay, what do we have? Minus three times two is minus six. Then nothing, then plus six, again, zero. So the two vectors in this basis, the two vectors in this basis are orthogonal to this vector in this basis. So immediately, I already, already have a guarantee, but let's just do the general case, right? So if there's a vector in the row space, a vector in null space is going to be some linear combination of these two, right? So it's going to be a v1 plus b v2. And a vector in the row space is going to be c times r1. And now the question is, is this vector perpendicular to this vector? We can check a v1 plus b v2, take the dot product. So I want, to, let's call this x, let's call this y. And now I'm taking x transpose y, which is a v1 plus b v2 transpose r one what do we get? We get A V1 transpose um, C R1 plus, let's put a parenthesis here, and we have B V2 transpose C R1. Okay, please always remember that these numbers A, B, C, these symbols A, B, C stand for scalars, which are just numbers. So B transpose doesn't really make sense because it's just B itself, it's a number. So it makes sense because the one by one, the transpose of a one by one, let's just, uh, you know, if we're going to technical B transpose is just what doesn't really change anything. So scalars don't really matter as far as the transpose is concerned. And you can take the scalars out, right? So this is just AC and we have V1 transpose R1 plus BC V2 transpose R1. And this is something that we've already checked, right? So Vt transpose R1 and V2 transpose R1 is just equals to zero, so I get zero. And so we've done an example where we've seen that the row space is actually every vector in the row space is orthogonal to every vector in the null space. Let's carry forward the same example and let's talk about the column space, right? So the other Sorry, the other aspect of this is that the column space is orthogonal to the null space of a transpose. And we can do the same thing. We can first try to find out their dimensions and the bases and then verify that these are indeed perpendicular to each other. So let's try to figure out a basis the basis for column space. And that's particularly easy. So let's do that. We know that we can get the basis for the column space immediately from the um, eliminated matrix R. Okay, so here we go. This is the first one. And this is the original matrix. Okay, so we discussed this in the last lecture, the idea being that how do we identify a basis for the column space? And the idea was that this, if we look at this matrix, reduce matrix R, and if we check the pivots, the pivot column, so the pivot columns identify identify the independent columns, independent columns. And so if the pivot columns do identify this independent columns, we can't take the, the same column from R because we know that the column space of A is not equal to the column space of the reduced matrix. And this is something that we did in the last lecture. We discussed why the column space changes because you're doing row operations, which means they're not going to preserve the column vectors, okay? 
So yeah, they identify the independent columns, but then you take that column, that particular corresponding column in the original matrix, right? So it tells you which columns to take, but the columns that you end up taking are from the original matrix. So two, four, the basis, you have only one matrix and only one vector in the column space and the basis for the column space, okay? So this is just one dimensional. Okay. That's fine, but um, where is this space? We know that the column space is a subspace for the n sorry, the m dimensional space, right? So this was a two by three, and so m was two, n was three. So the column space is of course a subspace of the two dimensional space, right? Because it has two entries. This is obvious. C is the basis for C A. Okay. What else? The other thing that we can check is now we want the basis for the null space of a transpose. And how do we do that? We do that in the following way. How did we, um, we discussed that in the last lecture that the, for the basis of the null space, you need to keep track, keep track of the elimination elimination matrix. And that's very easy to do in this case because I think we only did one row operation. Where was it? Here's the row operation we did. Mm, yeah, here it is. We just did row two minus two times row one. So we make an elimination matrix. This was a two by three. So I can make it two by two elimination matrix. And that elimination matrix has ones on the diagonal zero here and what we had here was minus two. So this was E, just one matrix. So E to one is just E, okay? So this is what we did. We said E to one, E times my matrix, two, one, three, think four, two, six, and one, one, zero, minus two gave me the zero, zero vector, right? So this is giving me zero, 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 right? So I wanted to solve AX equals to zero, right? Okay, so this, and sorry, no, this gave me the reduced matrix R. So this was, sorry, EA gave me the reduced matrix R. So if this was two, one, three, two, one, three, zero, zero, zero. Okay. So why did we do this? We did this because the null space of A transpose, remember that the null space is saying that A T X is equal to zero, which in other words is saying X T A is equal to zero. That some row times the whole matrix gives you a zero row, okay? So this is sort of zero transpose. So if you think about this, if you isolate this second row, right, and if you isolate this second row of R, you see that when you multiply minus two, one with the matrix A, with the matrix A, two, one, three, four, two, six, then you get the zero row because this is just saying minus two of first row plus row one. This row operation is simply doing minus two R2 plus, sorry, minus two R1 plus R2, that's just what this row is doing. Taking the linear combination of these rows, giving a zero row, right? And this is just a solution. This is just XT A giving me the zero row, which means this is part of the null space of A transpose. This is just, if I do it like this, if I flip this over, then I have really just take the transpose, two, one, three, four, two, six, transpose them like this, then transpose this, minus two, one, then I've actually solved A T X, A transpose X is equal to zero without even doing Gaussian elimination on this column vector, right? That's just going to give me the same thing. So let's check it out. Two times minus two, minus four. Plus four gives me zero. Minus two plus two gives me zero. Minus six plus six gives me zero. So I have a basis now, I have a basis for the null space of a transpose, which is just contains this minus two, 
one. Okay. So here it is. It's the basis for the column space. This is the basis for the null space. And we can immediately check that these two follow the same kind of thing. So we, we were in R2. So M was equals to two. This is one dimensional. So the dimension of the column space of A plus the dimension of the null space of A transpose is equals to, this was one dimensional. This is one dimensional because I'm just counting the number of vectors that I have in the base space, one plus one, and it adds up to two, right? So that's fine, they add up, it's add up, adding up to M. Okay, and the second thing that we can check, of course, is that these two are orthogonal, and that's very easy to do. Any vector in the null space is just a multiple of this minus two, one, so Xn is going to look like some A times minus two, one, and any vector over here, let's call it V or Xc, is going to look like E times two, four. So let's take the dot product. Okay, so let's take the dot product of, we have Xn is equals to A minus two, one. Let's just call it minus two A. This is another way that I can do this. Xc is equals to C times two, four, even though I don't need to multiply these numbers together. But let's just do that, two B, four B. Okay, another way to check that. So Xn, I want Xn transpose Xc. What do I get? I get, let's put it in row form, minus two A, A. This is in vector form, two B, four B. I could have chosen to take the scalars outside, which is something that I did in the previous example over here. I'm dealing with the scalars themselves. So minus two A times two B is minus four B, four AB, and then A times four B is plus A times four B, which is just minus four AB plus four AB, which is zero. So the null space of A transpose is orthogonal to column space of A, and that's it. Okay, so that's another example of the same thing that we did so far. Um, I think I've covered all the theory that I wanted to do in this lecture. There's one more thing that I'm going to at least hint at that is something that we're going to do in the next lecture. But let me just give you an idea of what that's going to be. Okay, so here's the whole perhaps. Okay, we're going to talk about two themes. The first theme is the first theme is the following. If AX equals to P has no solution, can I find an approximate solution? And that's a weird thing to ask, right? It's saying that if AX equals to P has no solution, that there's no AX exactly equal to the vector b. So we're saying that there does not exist any x such that ax is exactly equal to b. Can I find, can I find an x such that ax is approximately equal to b, something like b, even if it's not exactly b. That's the first thing. The second theme starts off from a problem that you do called linear regression, right? Or fitting a curve, fitting a line through some points. And linear regression is just fitting a line rather. And the idea is that if you have a set of points, and this is something that you've done perhaps um, from high school or even um, earlier than that, that is the problem is if you have a bunch of points that are supposed to lie in a line but they don't because there is some noise in the measurement. Can you find the line of best fit across them, right? And that's really solving a linear system. The linear system that you're solving is you're basically saying this is an equation y equals to mx plus c. And I have a bunch of points, x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, and x4, y4. 
So you're basically asking the question, if I have y equals to mx plus c, can I make this line as close as possible such that it satisfies all the points? Well, it won't satisfy all the points, but the idea is, can I find y1 equals to mx1 plus c, y2 equals to mx2 plus c, y3 is also equals to mx2 plus c, and y4 is equals to mx2 plus c. So the idea is find, we're not solving for x and y here. There are some points y1, y2, y3, x1, x2, x, sorry, x3 and x4. We're trying to find an m and a c such that they satisfy as many equations as possible, as many, as many equations as possible, right? So <clears throat> if you think about it in terms of a system, this is just a system of equations. So how many unknowns does it have? It has unknowns. There are two unknowns and equations are equal to four. So this is an AX equals to B problem where B's are the set of Y's, X's are the set of X, X coordinates, set of Y coordinates, and these are the coefficients that you're solving for. Coefficients, right, that you're going to solve for. Sorry, um, these X's are the coefficients. And A contains the bunch of X coordinates, B contains a bunch of Y coordinates. Okay, and this is, you can simply think about extending this problem to higher problems, right? So for example, if I have, if I say, okay, I have now some points that lie on this curve, this is still linear regression because you're going to be solving a linear system. So what now I'm thinking, okay, this doesn't look like a line. I'm going to fit a parabola through it. So Y equals to um, AX squared plus BX plus C. And now I have some points X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3, X4, Y4, and X5, Y5. And so if I plug them in, I get Y1 equals to AX1 squared plus BX1 plus C. So this is known, this is known, this is known. So again, I have an equation. We are going to have five equations of the form yi equals to axi squared plus exi plus c. So again, you're solving a system of the form ax equals to b, where x is going to be my unknowns a, b, c, and this is going to be my set of coordinates y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, and a will contain all the coefficients, right? So the coefficients of a are x1 squared, um, x1, and then, well, in this case, it's just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and x2, 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 sorry, x2, x3, x4, x5, and in this case, x2 squared, x3 squared, x4 squared. Try, if you don't follow this, try writing down these equations and then converting it into matrix form, and you will see that you get this system. And now the question is, solve it solve for A, B, C, okay? So this is something that we're going to take up in the next lecture, trying to find this line of best fit, curves of best fit, trying to do linear regression through these ideas of love space, row space, and uh, so on and so forth. So we're going to basically do, this is something that you've done in statistics, um, linear regression, but now we're going to do linear regression through linear regression in matrix form. Okay, that's it for today.